Hey everyone, thank you for joining me on today's episode of Bible Backdrop. Today, we're continuing our series on the cities where Paul wrote his letters. Last episode, we talked about the city of Ephesus. This week, we're looking at the city of Philippi. In Paul's time, Philippi was a city in Macedonia, just north of mainland Greece, and it was nine miles away from the seaport of Neapolis. It lies on a plain that is bounded on the east and north by mountains, on the west by Mount Pangaeus, and on the south by a ridge that was in antiquity called Symbolum. The ancient name of the city was Crenides, so named for the springs that fed the river and marsh. Some historians believe that the city was called Dayton, which became proverbial among the Greeks for good fortune. Later scholars believe that this was the name for the whole area, not just the city. The Thracians founded the colony of Dayton around 360 BC. Before we get too far, I want to talk about the difference between Thracians, Macedonians, and Greeks. Thracians are the hardest to pin down. They seem to have come from Europe and don't have much to do with the Greeks except for when they need to be allies of convenience, such as for a common enemy. The Thracians were a loose confederation of tribes and didn't have a central governing body. They spoke an Indo-European language instead of Greek. The Macedonians, on the other hand, appeared to come from Greek stock, but were seen as culturally backwards. They shared a common religion and language, but that was about it. While culture, philosophy, and trade flowed between Macedon and the Greek city-states, they were still seen as different from the rest of mainland Greece. Finally, when we talk about the Greeks, mostly this includes the Greek city-states of antiquity, Athens, Sparta, Thebes, Corinth, etc. By comparison with other nations at the time, they were seen as quite advanced in their knowledge of mathematics, philosophy, and government. The reason I bring all this up is that each group plays a different part in this time period, and it's good to understand the differences between the three. Now back to our story. Like I said, the colony of Dayton was founded by the Thracians in 360 BC with the help of an exiled Athenian statesman named Callistratus. The area was extremely fertile and was also a location of several gold mines. A year later, Philip II of Macedon ascended the throne and targeted the possession of this colony very early on in his reign. Not only did it have these natural advantages, but a fortified post here would protect the natural land route from Europe to Asia and protect the eastern frontier against Thracian attacks. A year after his ascension to the throne, Philip executed this plan and seized the area. It was at this time the city was enlarged, fortified, and renamed Philippi, after the king that captured it. The biggest windfall from this move was the gold mines, and they produced over a thousand talents a year. As we learned in the Bible math episode, a talent was between 75 and 80 pounds. Multiply by a thousand, and you've got a lot of gold. Philip used this gold not just to build up his army, but he was actually able to produce enough coinage to rival and then supersede the Persian Darik, the common money of the day. Philip also used this gold in making his conquests easier. He was known for saying that, quote, no fortress was impregnable to whose walls a donkey laden with gold could be driven, end quote. After Philip takes over the area, and while Alexander quickly builds the world's largest empire, the city of Philippi simply keeps plugging along. Nothing much is heard of the city itself. In 168 BC, after the Battle of Pydna, it passed over to the Romans. In 146 BC, all of Macedonia was formed into a single Roman province. By this point, the mines were almost exhausted, and Philippi, as a result, had started to shrink into a small settlement. Soon, though, all that was about to change. So, what was the cataclysmic event that was going to spark this change? Well, it was nothing less than the downfall of the Roman Republic. It started on the Ides of March, 44 BC, when Julius Caesar was murdered in Rome. Soon after, a triumvirate was formed that included Mark Antony, Caesar's close friend and advisor, and Octavian, Caesar's adopted son who would later become the Emperor Augustus. The conspirators, Brutus and Cassius, got away and put together an army that included Roman legions and some mercenaries. In 42 BC, Antony and Octavian met Brutus and Cassius in two battles at Philippi. 
In the first battle, Antony was able to defeat Cassius, but Brutus routed Octavian with a surprise attack. In the second battle, three weeks later, the combined forces finally beat Brutus' army. When that happened, many of the veterans decided to remain in Philippi, and it became a Roman colony. This helped expand the population, and many of their descendants stayed in the area. While nine miles from the seaport of Neapolis, Philippi did have another strategic asset. It lay on the major Roman road known as the Via Ignatia. Due to the mountains in the area, this was the only road that connected to the important seaport. As a result, trade flourished in the city. Culturally, although it was a Roman colony, the city's long history made it a true melting pot. Hellenistic Greek culture was still prevalent, while Roman culture grew alongside it. There may have been a smattering of Thracian language and culture, although most had probably been absorbed by the Greeks and Romans. As we will talk about later, there seemed to be almost no Jewish presence in the city. Recent excavations have found a large forum, theater, and a jail. Some claim it's the jail that housed Paul and Silas, but that seems unlikely. The population was around 10 to 15,000, with the majority being slaves, service providers, and farmers, many of whom were descendants of the veterans that were given land in the area when they retired. There was still a minority of actual military veterans in the city, but it seems they comprised a very small minority, maybe about 3% of the population. However, they probably had quite a bit of influence with Philippi's elite. The breakdown seems to be about 40% were Roman citizens, while about 60% were non-citizens. Like all Roman cities, religion included the normal pantheon to the Roman and Greek gods. In addition, there's some evidence that the imperial cult, where the emperor was worshipped as a god, may have been a substantial part of the religion in Philippi. This may make sense given that a lot of military veterans owed their living to Octavian, or Augustus as he was called when he became emperor. While substantial though, most don't believe it was the central religion of the area, and most people worship the entire pantheon. In the book of Acts chapter 16, Paul comes to Philippi during his second missionary journey. He sets sail from Troas and reaches Neapolis on the following day. From there, he takes the Via Ignatia, which can still be seen today, into Philippi. In verses 12 through 40, we get a detailed account of what happened during his time there. First, he meets a group of people, mostly women, who came down to the river to celebrate the Sabbath. This tells us that while there were Jews and converts to Judaism, there weren't enough to establish a synagogue. The rule was that it took 10 men to form a synagogue, and it appears that there weren't enough in the city to start one. Paul speaks to this group, and one of them, named Lydia, received the gospel and became a convert to Christianity. They then stayed with her during the rest of their time in the city. The chapter goes on to talk about how a demon-possessed slave girl, whose owners used her to earn money by her fortune-telling, was following Paul and his companions around shouting, quote, These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. End quote. Paul finally has enough of this and commands the demon to leave her. The girl's owners, who see their source of income immediately dry up, aren't too happy about it. They drag Paul and Silas to the magistrates, saying that they are teaching Romans to follow an unlawful religion. Certain religions were recognized by Rome and were legal to follow, such as Judaism. Christianity was not legal, and you could be punished for trying to make converts. Without a trial, they were publicly beaten, put in the inner cell of a prison, and locked in stocks. During the night, as Paul and Silas were singing hymns and praising God, there was an earthquake, which were not uncommon in the area, and it affected the foundations of the prison and caused all the doors to open. The jailer rushes over and sees that the doors are open and believes that the prisoners have escaped. Roman law stated that if a prisoner escapes, the jailer must trade his life for the life that escaped. Believing that he will have to pay the ultimate price, he plans to save his honor and take his own life. Paul stops him and tells him that they are all still there. The jailer is overcome with relief, and almost certainly gratitude, and takes Paul and Silas to his home, tends their wounds, and he and his whole family become followers of Jesus. The next morning, the magistrates send word to release Paul and Silas. Paul responds and tells them that they humiliated Roman citizens by publicly beating and imprisoning them without a trial. 
If they want them to go, they'll have to come tell them in person. The Bible says the magistrates became, quote-unquote, alarmed, which is probably a massive understatement. Beating a Roman citizen without a trial could get them stripped of their rank and their property. They could even pay with their lives. The magistrates come and beg Paul and Silas to leave. Before doing so, they went to Lydia's house to encourage the fledgling church and eventually went on to Thessalonica. The letter Paul writes to the Philippians is a mix of thankfulness, encouragement, and warning. He is thankful for their steadfastness in the faith and encourages them to stand firm in the face of persecution. He then warns them against Judaizers, Jews that said converts had to follow the law of Moses and be circumcised, and libertines, followers of worldly things. He wraps up by thanking them for the gifts they have sent and commending two of his disciples, Timothy and Epaphroditus, to them and accept them as they would accept him. With that, we are done with the city of Philippi. Moving on, the next episode will cover the city of Colossae, and then we will wrap up the series with the city of Thessalonica. If you are enjoying Bible Backdrop and haven't done so already, please leave a 5-star rating and review. Also, as I've said previously, word of mouth is the best way for this podcast to grow. Please share with your friends and encourage them to subscribe. As always, if you want to get in touch with the show, you can send an email to biblebackdrop at gmail.com. Thank you for listening and have a great week.